Hi, folks. We're going to wait just a couple of minutes uh, for folks to get on and get organized and get their audios synced up. We're so delighted here to have Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor. Uh, she's recently wrote a book that we're going to be talking about and has some really just incredible research that's being done in Arizona. We'll wait one more minute. And we encourage folks to uh, say hello in the chat and let us know where you're, where you're tuning in from. And certainly feel free to share questions or ask questions during our conversation. We're going to go ahead and get started. So Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor has devoted decades of researching the effects of grief on the brain. Her book, The Grieving Brain, is fascinating and a wonderful read, really very tangible for the everyday person to understand all of those questions that you or you may have with your loved ones who are experiencing grief. Why are they doing these sorts of things? There's actual physiological and biological underpinnings. And Dr. O'Connor does such a wonderful job in The Grieving Brain, outline in her book, The Grieving Brain, outline exactly what's going on um, for a bereaved individual. She's the director of the Glass Lab at the University of Arizona, which investigates the effects of grief, loss, and social stress on the brain and the body. And we are so thrilled, Dr. O'Connor, to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. And please call me Mary Frances. <laughs> Fair enough. So the first question I have for you is, um, I'm a basic scientist. I was a woman trained in basic science. And, you know, we were brought up in an era where women, we were sort of more frontier individuals. I mean, certainly not the pioneers, um, but I would say front, frontier, the frontiers of science. And so tell me, what drew you to science to begin with? Um, because it wasn't a discipline that I think in our upbringing and in our generation was really um, promoted for girls. Well, I have my parents in large part to thank for that. They were both educators. My mother was a primary school teacher and my father was a college professor. So I followed in his footsteps. But I think they also, they were big feminists and they really kept instilling in us, you can do whatever you want. On the other hand, neuroscience still has fewer women in it than men. And I think that for myself, sticking with it was, uh, it was a challenge because science is hard. <laughs> and so I think, you know, being around people who were willing to, you know, support my, my career and also always having my folks in the back of my head sort of believing in me. I think those were two of the primary reasons. That's wonderful. And the, the, the second question I had was why neuroscience? Um, because I think that's, I mean, for me personally, one of the most fascinating um, facets of science, but also, as you said, it's, it's an incredibly challenging discipline that really integrates so much basic science and there's still so much to learn. And so, Tell me, how did you go from, okay, I want to pursue science to neuroscience? Well, I, again, serendipity. Uh, I mean, I was fascinated by science. I had done science fair projects, you know, as a kid. And um, I actually started college as a music major. But as one of my bread courses, uh, I took introduction to neuroscience because someone in my dorm was taking it, right? And I just fell in love. I just was fascinated by how the brain works. And because this is in the in the early 90s, uh, neuroimaging was brand new. There were a few places around the world where we could look inside that black box. And so I sort of grew up as neuroscience, at least as neuroimaging grew up. And in a way that made it easier for me because I think I was sort of adopting things as they were changing. Um, and so, you know, maybe that was part of why, but it was really, it's really the passionate curiosity about the brain. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so then take us through the whole arc on how you landed into grief, because I do see you as one of the pioneers actually in grief neuroscience. 
Yes, the, the very first neuroimaging study of grief was published in 2003, and that was a study uh, by myself and some colleagues at the University of Arizona. Um, you know, I think the sort of combined interest in grief and neuroscience was a very unusual lens, but there were certainly reasons I was in both, and I've described sort of my passionate interest in neuroscience. But I think the thing about grief is you know, I had experienced grief. So my mother was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer when I was in eighth grade. And so, you know, she, I didn't know this at the time, but she was not thought to live through the year. And she lived another 13 years, which really was just a miracle. But it meant that grief was very much a part of my home life and sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop, so to speak. And so that meant that when I was in graduate school and I was doing a clinical psychology degree with neuroscience as my minor, I just, I felt really comfortable with people who were grieving, right? If you cry uncontrollably in an interview, I understand that. And so then sort of trying to match up, listening very carefully to what people were telling me about their experience and trying to match that up with these brain images that I was seeing led to a sort of unusual way to look at grief, but I think one that gives us a lot of tools. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's so interesting, the parallels between how you sort of landed here and I will say, and myself sort of spending lots and lots of time with interviews with individuals and then learning the social policies and, and sort of bridging that. So it's sort of a very similar construction. Yeah. So. First, um, we'll share we'll share a link to your book in our in the chat so people can have access to that. But tell us, just start us off very basic, and tell us what is grief and what is grieving, and is there a difference? I think that this is a distinction that is very helpful. Although we use the word grief and grieving very interchangeably in sort of everyday language. But I actually discovered it because of doing neuroimaging studies. So grief is that wave, right? It's that moment where you just feel sad or yearning or guilt or so many different things and the thoughts are running through your head. But it's a wave, right? It's a moment in time. Grieving, on the other hand, is the way that grief changes over time. The reason that I discovered the importance between these two is in the original neuroimaging study of grief, we had people come into the scanner and they brought us a photograph of the person who had died, which I scanned into the computer and could show people on goggles while they're lying in the scanner to see what brain activity was stimulated. But I realized that was just how they were doing in that moment. It was a study of grief. But many of the questions that I had were about grieving was this person feeling less grief than they did six months ago? Were they feeling more grief? And so grieving would mean that I would need to do more than one neuroimaging scan to see how things had changed over time. And so the reason I think it's helpful is grief is just the natural reaction to being aware of loss. And so we will feel grief forever. Grief is something that is when we are aware of what we have lost. And that will happen years after a loved one has died. You know, if I open a book and I see my mom's handwriting in there, of course, I'm still going to have grief in that moment. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with me. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with my grieving. It doesn't mean that I've not somehow adjusted, but just that in the moment I have it. So we'll have less intense and less frequent waves of grief over time because we've been grieving, even though we will still have grief forever. Oh, that's so helpful. Thank you. Um, and so fascinating. I don't think that I've heard someone else sort of really articulate it in this fashion before. Um, I was really intrigued while reading your book about the role of yearning in, 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 in grief and grieving. And I'm hoping that you can speak to that. Yearning you can think of as the thirst or hunger for something so vital to our survival, our loved ones. When we bond with 
the person who becomes our spouse or we bond with our baby, that bonding experience changes our brain. It literally changes the way the proteins are folded around our genes. It changes the neural connections that happen. And it means that with that bonding, we have this enduring belief. I will always be there for you and you will always be there for me. There's a sort of everlasting nature to this bond. That's why, you know, People can leave and go off to work every day and send your children off to school because we know that everyone is motivated to come back together again at the end of the day. And if they are absent, if the person is missing, we yearn for them. We need them. We want to be with them. And that process of yearning and then reuniting with them and feeling rewarded for reuniting with them, right? The release of all those wonderful chemicals in our body when we're reunited keeps those relationship bonds strong. So while a loved one is alive, you can see how very important that is to keeping these relationships going. The really dramatic problem that happens is when a loved one has died, we continue to yearn for them for a long time, often. And it's because there's that everlasting belief. On the one hand, you have a memory. You know you know, you were either there at the bedside or you got that phone call or you were at the funeral. You know the reality of what has happened. But this attachment neurobiology continues to have us yearn for this person because the brain has a solution to the person not being present. And the solution is go get them, right? That's what yearning is, go get them. It continues to have that motivation after the death because of our attachment neurobiology until we truly come to understand, oh, this person is gone forever. And I understand now what that means for my life and how to restore a meaningful life for myself. So this is why I think that yearning is so important. It's that thirst and it continues on for a long time while our brain is trying to understand what has happened. So, and correct me if I'm wrong on this. So sometimes when I talk to people, I'll describe this as, you know, your brain has actually sort of laid highways. It's laid the concrete for these relationships. And because they died, the concrete's still there. Yeah. Yeah. And the brain is still going down those, those roadways, looking and searching and not, not seeing that person yeah. it initiates, I guess, that, that yearning. Yes. And one reason why time helps in, in sort of diminishing the intensity yep. um, for some people, for most people, is because those roadways, those concrete roadways begin to get broken down little by little. And so it sort of makes getting out of bed a little bit easier. It makes functioning a little easier. And for your family or friends who may look on to you and say, they're still having trouble. Um, You know, I mean, that I I feel like that's a common community um, concern, but they're having trouble because those pathways are still very much in place in the brain. Yeah. I think it can be helpful. You can think of grieving as a form of learning, right? And the brain has to learn what the heck happened and how do I act now? And you're right. The the concrete of these connections, it isn't going to go away right away. And so our brain, it isn't that we just need time, it's that we need experience. Because experience, Mm -hmm. although that takes time, obviously, experience Mm -hmm. is the new highways that get laid, right? So, oh, when I'm at the store and I go to reach for the soy milk, because my husband is lactose intolerant and I buy soy milk, oh wait, I don't have to do that now because he's gone. Right. So that constant learning how the loss of this person changes everything. It means it's not that you're, it's not that there's anything wrong with you. It's that you're on a learning curve and you can only move through that learning curve so fast. Your brain can only understand what's happening and make new experiences as fast as it does. And so that's part of why it takes so long and it just does. 
Yeah. So I'm so intrigued. And I also want to just invite folks to ask questions in the chat if they have questions along the way. So tell me, how do you study grief in the brain? How is that actually conducted? Well, we have a few different methods. One of the most common methods we've had so far, uh, you know, I, I really struggled initially. How are we going to, you know, if you've ever been for a CT scan or an MRI scan, that environment, you know, the white sort of noisy hospital environment, you think, I don't know how I'm going to get people to feel grief while they're in the scanner. And so we thought about what people do sort of naturally. And if I know you and I know a loved one of yours has died, you might show me a photograph of them. This is who it is, right? Uh, you might tell me the story of what happened. And so we took, we asked people to provide us photographs of the person who had died. So they brought those in when they came in for an interview. And we took words out of the stories that they told us, um, the word cancer, the word ambulance. And so when they're lying in the scanner, then we're able to see uh, how the brain is reacting when they're looking at a picture of their loved one. And we compare that to when they're looking at a picture of a stranger or another familiar person, but not the person who is the source of grief for them. And by looking at the comparison of those, then we can isolate what brain activity is specific to grief or what words, you know, that remind you of the loss distinct from just neutral words, uh, are, are stimulating um, parts of the brain that create that grief experience. So that's the most common way that we use. Although the other way that's being used more recently in my lab and in a couple of other labs is actually a lot of grieving takes place unintentionally. You know, you'll have this experience. You're sitting at a stoplight and you're just blah, 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 making a grocery list in your head. And suddenly you're thinking about the person who's died, right, for no apparent reason and often get upset. And so it's also the sort of just resting state that we're interested in, not having a specific reminder, but simply how often or how much or in what way does this person come to mind? And so we literally just have people lie in the scanner and let their mind wander. And then we look for how they're reacting to that whether they're ruminating, whether they have these continuing thoughts about their loved one. So both ways. Yeah, so let me ask you a, a, a question. Um, so from a bereaved mother, um, and I also am a bereaved mother, and so I can very much relate to this question. Yeah. Um, so what, what if you don't want that concrete road to break down? Yeah. Um, sort of how do you balance you know, the capturing. I remember too, personally, when things, some things were slipping, it was like a balloon. I was constantly like, no, 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 no. I'm not ready yet. I can't have that go yet. Yeah. How do you preserve that as well as the well-being for the individual, honoring the child? How does that work? I think this is such an important question. And I think this is where we often get stuck, right? I don't want the pain to go away because the pain feels like my link to the person who's died. Well, you can understand why you wouldn't want that to go away. I think what's helpful is to remember there are many networks in the brain. And so we look at people who are bereaved, who are really struggling, who are having a lot of pain. We also look at people who are bereaved, who seem to be adapting okay, that they are more resilient. We still see a grief reaction from them but it's different in the way that the brain isn't yearning for the person as though they might see them again. So here's the important part. Your loved one changed your brain in a way that will, is always going to be true. They are a part of your brain now. They are in your memories, which are physically a part of your brain. You can call them to mind and imagine them in conversation. You know what their values are, and you might sort of enact those values going forward. Those things will not change, even if you accept and allow some of that pain to go away. Because in reality, your relationship with the person wasn't about pain. That wasn't the link. The, the relationship was about love. And so to the degree that we can experience love for the person who's died, and maybe even because of that experience, demonstrate that love to other living loved ones or to, you know, 
creating a foundation or other sort of uh, things that we might generate, that love is the connection with the deceased person, not pain. Pain is just because of this one event that happened, the death. Love is what means the bond is ongoing. So we have a number of questions in the chat, and I think some of them relate to each other. And so I just want to pause and recognize one here that um, people are just so thrilled to have you here. And, and I can just say from interviewing and talking to so many people across the country, I think it must feel so validating that like something is actually happening that other people can't see and few people really understand. Um, there's a question in the chat um, from a bereaved and also a bereaved mother who lost their daughter about a year ago. Okay. And so they're approaching the anniversary yeah. and the yearning is ramping up the anxiety. And she's talking about this in stratospheric levels. I mean, those of us, you know, we've, 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 we've had, we've had those milestones before. It's yeah. almost, I often say there are no words really yeah. um, for these, these types of feelings. So the tools that she's developed to cope are not working. Yep. So is her suffering more neurological is it an emotional response to the anniversary? Sort of help us understand that yeah. a little more. I think this is very mysterious for people and, and hopefully this will shed some light. So the first thing to know is I don't think of neurobiology and emotion as different from each other. So you can sort of think of them as different levels of analysis. Uh, they're both going on simultaneously and they're related to each other, it turns out, right? So uh, so I wouldn't give that, I wouldn't say it's because of one or the other, both are happening. Mm. The other thing to know is we see in evidence in large studies that there is an anniversary effect. So another thing to know is this is totally normal. If we look at uh, a group of hundreds of participants in a study and we look at the grief that they've told us they're having in February and in July and then we look specifically at the month that the person died or the month of the birthday of the person we see much higher levels of grief on average compared to any other month so the point here is just it is normal so that's also helpful I think often to to understand absolutely the, the reality is that grief comes and it goes, it comes in waves and it goes, and that's going to happen more intensely and more frequently for many people at anniversaries, at holidays, and so forth. And so you're right, many of the coping skills that you've discovered are wonderful and you should try to use them. And it may also not be working right now. You may want to find see if there are other skills that you can use. Some people find that preparing for that day, for what rituals might happen on that day, the way you might find comfort from others who either have had loss experiences themselves, and so they really get it, or family members who knew your deceased child. Um, planning can often be helpful, especially with a plan B. So I like to say we make a plan, and then in case on that day, that plan is not working for us, we have a plan B, right? Um, so that can be very helpful for people. I think that it is simply something that will change over time. So a second anniversary will feel very different from a first anniversary and same with a third anniversary. And so in a funny sort of way, this is what grief is. This means that now you are someone that others can turn to in a few years when they are having their first anniversary. Grief is so universal that as much as we feel alone and, and wish for this one person, it does also connect us with a lot of other people. Absolutely. And I'll just say, I think part of the reason on the public policy side we've been so successful is that the level of experience when we're talking to people about this, they they get it fundamentally, but they didn't yep. realize that it there were biological or physiological underpinnings, yes. and then they don't realize that their systems or their the lack thereof systems around yeah. individuals and families 
for what we what what we usually term as functional coping or adaptive processing. Yeah. Um, is it fair to say then that individuals' sort of learning curve will then um, sort of be a, I, I, what the phrase we usually use here is it's on your own time at your own pace and on your own couch. And so is that right, that it's very individualized, um, you know, that learning curve that you talked about earlier? Yeah, it is very individualized. And, you know, when I as a clinician have seen sort of hundreds of people or I look at hundreds of people in a data set, of course I can see patterns. It's not that every single individual doesn't share anything with everyone else. So I can see patterns in the data, but the experience is very individual. It depends on the kind of relationship you had, the role they played in your life. And I will say, you know, one of the reasons that I think it's helpful to think of grieving as a form of learning is we can think about what are the circumstances under which learning is harder. Learning is harder if you have a lot of other stresses in your life. Learning is harder if you're under financial constraints or financial changes. Learning is harder if you're trying to do three jobs, right? So one of the reasons that I think these public policy changes are so important is it provides an environment in which we can learn, and that is only going to help with the learning curve, right? That support is only going to help with the learning curve, not necessarily to shorten it, although it might, mm -hmm. but more importantly, to help us find ways to restore a meaningful life, which you know, ironically makes us a better employee. It makes us a better parent. It makes us a better citizen if we have found a way to restore a meaningful life where we feel love, we feel generative, we feel creative. So I think that is one of the important reasons that these public policies are so important. You know, when I was when I was reading your book, The Grieving Brain, I kept going back to thinking, um, what about different forms of death? Mm -hmm. And um, do you see different neuronal patterning or has there been science done between sudden death or, I mean, stigmatized death? I, I, I sort of I, I sort of think about that because I think when I talk to families from different who've experienced different forms of death, they're different stigmas. So I think it depends on the lens that you right. take there. Um, but I often think it's who you lose, how you lose them and when you lose them yeah. that can really shape someone's experience pretty profoundly. Is there science to, or what is the science around, let's say, sudden death or stigmatized death? Yeah. So I will say there's not neuroimaging studies of sudden compared to death after a chronic illness, something like that. Um, we don't have neuroimaging studies around that, but we have lots of psychology studies around that, empirical studies. And we know that the suddenness of a death has a strong impact, especially on acute grief. So that initial period following the death. If you think about the idea that the brain is trying to learn what just happened, if it has no preparation at all, that's much harder to understand than if you had sort of even imagined that this might happen. That's a very different process of learning. So yes, I think unexpected losses, we know psychologically, have an impact and that that's especially important early on. Um, it may have less of an impact a year, two years later, what kind of death it was. As far as stigmatized losses, I think this is really important. Um, there are lots of losses that society doesn't recognize, right? Um, the death of an ex-spouse, very painful mm -hmm. for a lot of people and yet not something you're expected to feel. You divorced them or they divorced you. Why would you feel grief? But of course you do. That bond was there. And so I think often it has to do with whether there was a bond. Um, and so a great example of this, I think, is uh, miscarriage. So uh, miscarriage, spontaneous abortion, even abortion, that the that the we know that there is a bond that starts as soon as a couple know that they're pregnant right it starts with that imagination that relationship that starts forming and building and so the the infant doesn't have to be born in order for us to experience grief over a bond that has formed 
physiologically formed in our brain. And we do actually have one grief study uh, of uh, miscarriage. Um, and so this was a, a neuroimaging study that took place in Germany. Um, and uh, we see very similar reactions in the brain to other kinds of losses. But miscarriage is not something that's talked about very much. We don't necessarily expect people to have grief and people will say awful things like, well, you can try again, which is just the worst thing to say to someone. Um, and so here again, I think those public policies don't need to just address the death of a living, uh, sorry, the death of a loved one um, for whom there was a, an obvious kinship relationship, but also in the cases of miscarriage and abortion. Absolutely. Can you connect for us grief to guilt and regret or shame? Sort of take us through, take us yeah. through that arc. Yeah. So if you can think about it this way, um, psychologists use this term continuing bonds, this idea that after a person has died, you maintain a relationship with them, right, in your mind, because that everlasting nature of the relationship means that your mind continues to exist, coexist with them. And so um, I hear this, for example, a, a woman told me, you know, I was driving home from work and I felt like every song that came on the radio as though my deceased husband was like DJing the, you know, which songs came on the radio, right? So these sorts of continuing bonds are very, very common in people who are grieving. And so, ah, this is embarrassing. I've lost the train of the question, Joyle. Oh, that um, connecting grief to guilt. blame, shame, guilt, all yes, of the things right, that you, right. you tend to feel. Yes, sorry. Uh, and right. so if you think about that sort of ongoing relationship, now imagine that for a part of your mind, this person just disappeared, right? Like you've been ghosted by this person. Why are they not coming back to me? I think the feeling, although possibly not at a very conscious level, the feeling of guilt as you would if a relationship just dissolved or the feeling of blame if a relationship just dissolved for no apparent reason. Although part of your brain can retain what the reasons are, this person had cancer or this person had depression and died by suicide. Although part of your brain can keep up with the reality of the situation, another part of your brain just feels their absence and cannot explain it. And so those experiences of guilt or blame would repair a relationship often if the person still lived, right? If you feel guilty in a relationship, you would go to the person and say, I know you haven't been talking to me and I feel terrible about what I did, or I'm so angry with you, I wanna give you the opportunity to ask for my forgiveness, right? To maintain this relationship. So I think that is part of it. Part of your brain is just befuddled by the fact that this person could be gone. And so we continue to have emotional relationships with them. Tell, tell us more about grief and trauma, how they overlap, how they don't, how do they show up in, are there even studies that, that they show up differently maybe in the brain? Yeah. So I think this is really important. The way we use trauma in everyday language is quite different from the way we use trauma in neuroscience or in clinical psychology. So you can think of sort of the difference between PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder, which has the word trauma in it. The difference between that kind of a reaction to an event and even severe grief, even prolonged grief, right? Those are two different reactions. We know that from psychological data and from neuroscience data. And here's sort of maybe a, a way to help disentangle that. Um, in the case of a trauma, an event happened and during that event, you felt helpless to do anything about it. And now as you try to go on with your life, that feeling of helplessness now pervades everything. I feel like, how can I not be getting over this? I feel like this might happen again. I feel like other things might happen that are unsafe. So it's very much based in fear and anxiety. When the death of a loved one happens, the primary reaction is, how can they be gone? 
this can't be true. Or this is true and I'm going to feel this awful forever, right? So that protest about this can't be true or sort of that despair of I'll never have a good life again, that's very much based in sort of this sadness and yearning. So the anxiety and fear-based responses of helplessness and the, uh, and the sadness and sort of yearning experiences are slightly different and we think are using different pathways in the brain as well. So neuro, neuroimaging studies that looks at major people with major depressive disorder, people with PTSD, and people with prolonged grief disorder, they actually see that the reactions, the the chain, the um, the neural activity looks different in those three disorders, and that's maybe part of why. I should just quickly say, of course, after the death of a loved one, you can have major depressive disorder. You can have PTSD and you could have prolonged grief disorder and you could have some combination. So I'm not saying that they are exclusive to each other, but simply that they are kind of different reactions. And, and in some ways we can disentangle them. So many people have come and talked to us and they say, I'm feeling crazy. I, I like, I can't, I can't sort of get my arms around what's going on. And, you know, and um, not being understood by their their family, friends, or community. Can you tell us more about like what that is? Like I'm yeah. going crazy. Yeah. Well, I think a couple of things are going on. So we've been talking a lot about what happens in the brain, but we have to remember that grief is also a physiological event. And so we know that people's cortisol, that stress hormone, people's cortisol level goes up. People's heart rate and blood pressure go up for a while. When you think about how well are you able to function? You know, if you've drunk a whole lot of caffeine, right? It's not exactly the same analogy, but it's very difficult to stay focused and you're reacting differently to things than you would be. So you can think about the fact that those stress responses are happening in your body and that's changing your ability to think and concentrate and pay attention and remember. So that's one set of reasons that I think people feel like they're going crazy. They also can't sleep. And we know how hard it is to do any task when you can't sleep, right? And they can't sleep in part because of those stress hormones that are happening. So that, that's one set of reasons I think that people feel like they're going crazy. But another one is that your brain is processing a lot of information below the level of consciousness. So I like this, to describe this as, you know, if you've ever been working on like a Word document on your computer and in the background, it's trying to update some program and like you're typing, but the words aren't coming out for a long time. And then they sort of spurt out and it's very hard to do that task because actually your computer is spending a lot of effort and energy doing something else in the background that you can't see. And so I think of the brain a little bit in a similar way. It is trying to understand why you haven't bought soy milk, right? <laughs> While you're trying to make a grocery list. And so I think that can sort of help to um, clarify why that concentration is so difficult, why we feel like we don't, we're not remembering things well. The good news is for the vast majority of us, that does go away over time, that that is a, a temporary state that people are in. So you haven't, you haven't lost your mind permanently. You're just really downloading a big lot of information. What about replaying? I know replaying events and this yeah. and if that, then this, and the I call them the what, the what ifs or the if I only... Yeah. If, you know, the anyways, how how does that play a role um, in the in the early years of for yeah. grief? Yeah. So we sometimes call these intrusive thoughts um, and they are very, very common after the death of a loved one or any traumatic event. But um, they are very common after the death of a loved one. That's been known actually for a long time. And these are thoughts, like you said, they just keep coming back to you, even though you, you're not trying to think about them, you're not intending to think about them. For the vast majority of us, I think, again, your brain is trying to work out what happened. And so it's sending these even into your conscious awareness um, as it tries to grapple with what happened. And a lot of people feel almost pressured to talk about what happened. They need to express what happened to make sense of it. Um, so, so that's one set of thoughts um, that tend to resolve on their own. 
uh, there's a slightly different version of this, which is what I call the would have, should have, could have thoughts, that same if only set of thoughts. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, as you were describing, sort of, you know, I should have gotten them to the hospital sooner or, uh, you know, if only they would have known not to have that last drink or, right? So the brain, as amazing as it is, can also come up with an infinite number of scenarios where the situation might have turned out differently. None of them are true. The reality is, you know, all of those stories end in, and then my loved one lived. But the simple reality is that they didn't live. And you have to figure out how to be in the world where they didn't live. So the difficulty is when we get stuck in that rumination, in that, you know, those thoughts going round and round and round, it actually prevents us from being in the present moment, right? So if you're thinking this, you're not engaged, you know, with your grandchild in the ridiculous game she's making up, or you don't notice, right, that really sweet smile that the barista gave you for no reason at all, because you're not in the present moment, you're in your thoughts. So there are tools that we can learn to recognize, ah, this is my brain doing that thing it does, which even learning to recognize when it's happening is a big thing. And then how can I shift my attention? So it's not about whether the thoughts are true. Could that have turned out that way? The truth of the matter isn't the important part. It's whether having these thoughts are helpful to you, are helpful to restoring a meaningful life. And um, uh, someone I know whose son died by suicide, he described, you know, I realized there was no way through these questions that I've had to figure out how to go around them. And so I think uh, when people are struggling with that kind of issue, if they're not able to find these skills, often working with a psychotherapist, especially a psychotherapist who does cognitive behavioral therapy, where you really focus on automatic thoughts and, and sort of skills to manage them, you know, getting out into a different environment. Ah, I'm doing that thing again. I know it's mm. not helpful, but I can't stop myself. I'm going for a walk, right? Or I'm making a phone call or right ways to get yourself out of that stuck pattern of thoughts. You, um, in your book, The Grieving Brain, you share a story when you've gone off to college and your mom really needs to see the environment that you're in. And I found myself, and actually in advance of this, I got several uh, bereaved mothers asking, are there gender differences that present in, in, in grief or grief intensity? And of course, I also equally know many fathers who say yeah. we're always left behind. And so... I'm hoping that you can um, provide us a little bit more information yeah. on if there are gender differences and if so, what are they? Yeah. So I think a, a helpful distinction here is the difference between the experience of grief and the expression of grief. So we mm -hmm. know that the experience of loss, of feeling bereft and that pain and yearning that is universal. The experience internally, we see through all periods of history, through all cultures of the world, even through even in some animal species, we see behaviors that suggest that that is the internal experience that these animals are having. So I don't think there's any question that the experience of grief is true for everyone. The expression of grief, on the other hand, is very culturally defined right? So the things that we do now compared to a hundred years ago, when we've lost a loved one, look very, very different. And gender is a part of our culture. And so the ways that we are allowed to express our grief, encouraged to express our grief, or even feel natural as ways to express our grief, that does often vary by gender, although not always. And so one of the 
one of the things that I think is helpful about that is what you're seeing on the outside doesn't necessarily reflect the experience on the inside. So a person who feels comfortable crying in front of me, I don't necessarily assume that they are having more grief than the person who doesn't feel comfortable crying in front of me, if that makes sense. I think that's one distinction that can be really helpful. The other thing that there is some research to suggest is that people grieve in different ways. And we sometimes call this, um, uh, so some people uh, have a more intuitive emotional response and other people have what we call a more instrumental response. And so, you know, the guy who continues to take his son to baseball, even when he doesn't feel like it because his mother is gone and it's really important to him that this kid connects with his friends and that we just pretend for a little while that this crazy thing hasn't happened. That's a very instrumental way of grieving. I am doing the things to make this work now. It's a very different way of expressing grief. It is sometimes seen as gendered where men are likely to do more instrumental things. But I will also say, you know, the day after my dad died, my sister and I, who are very different people, I was just collapsed. I mean, I was exhausted. I was just, I was a mess. And I woke up and she said to me, I don't understand why I'm not feeling grief. And I looked and she had made like a dozen centerpieces for the memorial. She had written half the obituary. She'd been up practically, you know, half the night. And I was like, how is that not grieving? No, you're not crying, but this is clearly grieving to me. And so even though our exp our expression was very different, um, and in that case, it wasn't a gendered thing. It was simply a personality thing. It didn't make me think that we were having a different experience per se. So I have a question for you that I found when I was reading your book. Um, I found myself thinking about uh, major trauma episodes or major events that can actually leave an imprint on the DNA. Yeah. And I found myself wondering if there is any science yet, or if um, you sort of, you know, even postulate where this might be going, but is it possible that grieving can leave an imprint yeah. on the DNA that then can even be passed down through generations? Yeah. So, I think, I think you're talking about epigenetics. So the way that the genes are folded around, sorry, the way the proteins are folded around the genes. And I'll give my like two minute metaphor version of this, which is, you know, our genes are a recipe book, right? For all the proteins we might make in the body. And the epigenetics is like when there's a wrapper on the recipe book. So you may have the recipe, but you can't make it because there's a wrapper on it. And if you take the wrapper off, you change the epigenetics, now you could make the recipe for whatever protein. So that's sort of the, the, the mini version. One of the most fascinating things is, you know, you really can't talk about grief without talking about love and bonding. And from animal neuroscience, from studies of prairie voles, which are these little tiny rodents, who amazingly bond for life. Once one prairie vole has selected the other prairie vole, they will prefer each other over any other prairie vole. We know from neuroscience done with these animals that when that bond happens, there are epigenetic changes. The proteins are folded differently in a very specific region of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, doesn't matter. Uh, the proteins are folded differently once that bond has happened. And that is definitely part of what's creating that preference for this specific bowl. So there are epigenetic changes that happen uh, in the course of events in our life. Now that kind of epigenetic change will not be passed on because of course we want each bowl to have their own falling in love experience, so to speak. What's interesting is now, uh, this is a woman named Zoe Donaldson at the University of Colorado Boulder. She's studying what happens when you separate those pair bonded voles does that epigenetic change ever revert, right? So that the vole is able to make a new partner preference. So very early days, and we don't know that it would work exactly the same way in human humans. We have two pounds more brain than voles do. Um, but that's a kind of thing where I think at a very deep physiological level, level our bonds are physiologically encoded in us. 
Yeah, and just to share with folks, actually, Dr. Donaldson will be joining us in the coming months. I didn't want to do a basic science and a basic science back-to-back, so she'll, right. she'll join us in a few months. But this leads me to another question that we received um, where uh, whether or not there's a presentation of cognitive differences, including dementia. I mean, we are familiar with Deb Umrudson's work out of the University of Texas yeah. that there is a presentation or increased presentation of dementia, particularly among bereaved parents, and we see even magnified uh, presentation in Black Americans. She's only studied Black Americans. She doesn't have the data for um, Hispanic or Native nations, at least not yet. So help us understand, is there a connection between a death of a significant loved one? And the question that came into us prior to the prior to this conversation was someone's sister had just lost their son. And now they're starting to see early stages of dementia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, her sister is wondering, are these two things connected? Right. I think there's a few different ways to think about that. One that I personally think is the most likely, although I will say this is an active area of research, so we don't know. I can't tell you the answer to this. I think that perhaps one of the most likely scenarios is that an underlying process was going on where there were uh, where there was a trajectory where we weren't actually seeing symptoms yet. And this stressful event, which changes our stress physiology, it changes our lots of things about our inflammation levels, um, that could alter the trajectory to sort of accelerate it. And so what, what's important about that is the bereavement event, the death, didn't cause the Alzheimer's or didn't cause the dementia, but it may have revealed it in a way that may be sooner than it would have been otherwise, or possibly even it would have evolved now and the event simply happened in between. It, it does seem likely that there's a contributing event, a contributing factor of the bereavement because we see it more commonly after uh, the death of a loved one. But I think there is also there's a lot of there's a lot of work still here to be done because, for example, um, we can do interventions uh, with people where we see improvement in memory. So this person is bereaved. They're having a lot of difficulty. We do psychotherapy with the person, teach them new skills, maybe reduce their stress level through some of these skills. Um, and then we see improvement in memory. So, you know, I think this genuinely is a, is a pretty murky area, uh, but fortunately is an area we're really trying to get a handle on. It isn't just Alzheimer's that is increased after the death of a loved one. I think many of you will have heard of the broken heart phenomenon, which is a genuine phenomena where people are more likely to have um, uh, their own death after the death of, of a loved one, uh, increased mortality. But I think importantly also what you said um, about different communities, you know, you can really think of bereavement as a health disparity. If you think of it this way, that mortality rates are happening at different rates in different communities, that means that grief is happening in different ways in different communities so that, uh, you know, even during the pandemic, a child who was native was four and a half times more likely to lose their caregiver than a white child. And a black child was twice as likely to lose a caregiver. So these different rates of mortality mean that people from these under-resourced communities are losing more loved ones and they're losing them earlier in their own lifespan when they are younger developmentally. And that definitely has an impact on physiological and emotional health moving forward. Absolutely. And then to compound that with the systems yes. not being structured around, exactly. there is a cumulative disadvantage that right. really takes a disproportionate toll on some populations. Um, so I could ask you a thousand more questions, but we have to wrap up. And so I'm going to ask you one more question, or I guess it's technically two, that we ask everyone at the end of their presentation. 
And that is if we were on a stranded island and you had to pick a song or an album to play, what would it be? And then the second question is on that stranded island, um, what would we find you doing to contribute to the community? Hmm. This is great. So um, I'm very torn. Uh, as you know, I'm an author and I write every morning in a very uh, disciplined kind of way. And I listen to Bach cello concertos every single morning. I think it would be hard for me to go without those. But on the other hand, um, there are some Ani DeFranco albums, especially like uh, Little Plastic Castle that I'm not sure I could live without either. Um, and what would I be doing to contribute to the community? I think, honestly, um, I think emotional health is really important. I think it is more important to a community survival than we think of, um, both because of individuals and because it can really help with our relationships. And of course, relationships is what helps us all to survive and thrive. So probably I would be doing something to support emotional health among uh, the people on the island. Well, that's fantastic. Well, um, we really want people um, to, to check you out. We uh, are putting in the chat where they can find you, um, the website where they can find you. And um, we also supplied a, a link to the Grieving Brain. And we really hope that folks consider uh, reading your book. It's actually, it's phenomenal. And it raises so many, um, it, feel, it feels so validating to read that and raises so many questions, at least for me. And with that, we're going to sign off. We are going to have our next session on March 22nd at 2 p.m. with Dr. Julian Abel, who is the director of Compassionate Communities UK. And the project started to reduce ER admissions um, in the UK, but they discovered so much more. And we'll talk more in March about how it relates to our work here. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. O'Connor, um, and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Joyal. Take care. Bye-bye.